afternoon, everyone, and welcome today to today's Public Health Ontario Rounds presentation on novel disease surveillance tools for the next pandemic. My name is Karen Hohenadel, and I am the Manager of Communicable Diseases at PHO, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. Before we begin with today's presentation, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. The chat pod has been disabled to limit any distractions during the presentation, so please use the Q&A pod if you have questions. A discussion and question period will follow the presentation. And if at any point during the session you experience any technical issues, please email capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. I would like to state that as the moderator of this session, I do not have any potential conflicts of interest to declare. It is now my pleasure to introduce the speaker for today's presentation, Angel Desai. Angel, MD, MPH, is an assistant professor at the University of California, Davis, where she engages in clinical work, hospital epidemiology, and research. Thank you so much um, for that introduction. I'm so honored today to be able to speak to all of you about a topic which is near and dear to my heart, something that I've spent the last several years thinking about and working on, um, and something that I think probably has become um, more well known within the last, over the last two years. Uh, good morning to everybody or good afternoon. Um, I won't ask what the weather is like in Ontario right now, um, but I will say that it is, it's fairly beautiful in California today. Um, just to begin, uh, in terms of my disclosures, um, I have a couple of potential conflicts of interest to declare, namely uh, funding for research program support, one from the International Society for Infectious Diseases, which houses ProMed, one of the informal event monitoring systems I'm going to be talking about today, um, and also from Pandemic Tech, again, to fund some of the research that I've uh, worked on with ProMed and um, ISID. <clears throat> um, and just as a reminder, this presentation was peer reviewed to ensure that the principles of scientific integrity, objectivity and balance have been respected. So to start, I wanted to ask a question. Um, I apologize that the question I think is now a little outdated. I um, had meant to do this presentation last year and had an unfortunate running accident. So um, I think it still stands, but I think I would say, um, I would like to ask everyone, have you used digital disease event monitoring tools over the past 24 months now? Okay, so it looks like this is a good, there seems to be a fairly good balance here of some individuals who've used it. Um, and some who haven't. Uh, and so hopefully there'll be a little bit of something for everyone um, in terms of introducing these tools. So just to go over the learning objectives for today, um, there are three. One, I want to be able to identify the role and kind of give a little background about informal disease event monitoring and reporting tools. Um, and then two, define specific applications, specifically research applications of informal disease event monitoring systems for outbreak detection. Um, one of these applications go I'm going to be talking about is related to epidemic forecasting and real-time epidemic forecasting. And so that falls into the third learning objective, which is to try to discuss data limitations and challenges in this type of work, which again, I think has also become um, more widely appreciated over the last couple of years. And so to start to think about the role of these types of tools and what these tools really are, I wanted to start with a story. So um, this photo is actually taken, um, it's from Getty Images, but it's taken from a story that was published in Wire in March of 2020, um, which I encourage individuals to read if you haven't had the chance. It's, um, it's a good story. But uh, this takes place in December of 2019. Um, when the deputy editor for ProMed, which is an internet-based, event-based biosurveillance system, um, received a notification from a colleague um, who had been looking at social media channels in China um, and had noticed that there had been some discussion about a cluster of as of yet undiagnosed pneumonias um, in the area. And the, the deputy editor uh, at the time, she saw these notifications and felt that this was reminiscent of a prior outbreak that she had also uh, helped to uh, identify early on, which was SARS, and so quickly sent out a request for additional information from colleagues uh, in the area and in the region, um, and based of the, off of that was able to put out a post onto ProMed. 
that documented this. And this was that post. And so you can see it was right at the wire um, on December 30th, 2019, at 2359, right before the following day. And it simply said that there is a Wuhan unexplained pneumonia that's been isolated and results will be um, soon announced as soon available. And so as we know now, this was sort of the first recognition of what later became known as uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, and the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a really nice image um, I wanted to include from the Hopkins Center for System Science and Engineering. And it goes through those early few months of, um, of sort of how this information became available and how it rolled out. And so you can see here that the ProMed alert was the first, um, was the earliest announcement or sort of, uh, notification that there was some sort of cluster of unusual events occurring. And this happened a day before the outbreak was deigned as official by um, Chinese officials and um, other international health organizations. And from thereafter, you can see within the next three months how things unfolded. Seems like a long time ago now. And so I know that there are quite a few of you who mentioned that you're familiar with these systems and you use them often, but I wanted to just give a little bit of background about what I mean when I'm talking about event-based internet surveillance systems or novel disease surveillance systems or event monitoring systems, or sometimes they're known as informal um, disease uh, event monitoring systems. And so um, this is a graphic that's taken from a really nice systematic review from the International Journal of Medical Informatics. Um, this was from 2017, but I think a lot of this still applies. So as many of you know, um, the sort of traditional indicator-based surveillance system that has often been used or sort of really found is the foundation or bedrock of public health starts at sort of the level of the public as well as the level of the clinician and public health workers who identify a cluster of unusual events who then go up the chain um, present this information to local officials uh, as well as having additional information uh, diagnostic information from laboratories who then report to a central health agency depending on the region or the or the specific context that one lives in um, who then gives this information up to international organizations and there is a line missing here i think which is really the feedback loop um, coming from that central health agency back to the level of clinicians and public health workers to help design interventions um, that are targeted toward those specific events. Now, event-based internet biosurveillance systems work a little bit differently, um, or informal surveillance systems or event monitoring systems work a little bit differently. Um, and really there is sort of a, a process in which information is being fed into the system and that system is then disseminating outwards again. And it's all happening at the same time. And so information coming from clinicians, from labs, officials, health agencies, um, public health workers, and also I think there's another major component missing here, but informal sources of information. And that can include things such as the media, eyewitness reports on the ground or expert um, reports on the ground, as well as in some cases, social media as well. And this, I apologize, I think is a terrible slide because there's so much going on here. But I put it here really to uh, make the point or drive home the point that there are many of these types of programs out there, of these internet-based informal event monitoring systems. Now, this is also from that systematic review from 2017. And so since that time, there are even many more. Um, but I think this gives us sort of a good background of how many are, are um, have been active and for how long. You can see that most of them have really come uh, into being over the last decade or a couple of decades at this point, which makes sense because it sort of follows along the trajectory of just this explosion in um, the use of the internet and dissemination of information digitally. Um, the way that this systematic review or review partitioned these types of programs is from being a moderated system versus an automatic system. Moderated meaning there's some level of curation, um, human cur curation going on, as opposed to automatic, which really relies more on algorithms um, that can help identify particular surface signals in the internet. I think in reality, at least now, many of these systems have some combination of both. Um, they're not necessarily reliant just on one or the other, but I think this is still a use useful graphic to realize just the scope of uh, how these systems exist. 
And so there are a lot of, I think, advantages and also disadvantages to these types of programs um, and their potential application. And I want to be sure to underscore the point that when I talk about these types of informal event monitoring systems, I don't mean these to be a replacement for traditional public health, but rather as an adjunct um, and as a complement, something that can help assist um, public health uh, practitioners and, and those that work in public health uh, to help identify events of interest perhaps earlier um, than may otherwise may have otherwise been possible. And so that's really the main, I think, advantage of these systems is that there's fast detection and reporting. They're not necessarily constrained to certain events or certain locations, and they do allow for multiple sources of information or data streams to try to help better inform whatever events they um, report on. And I think the other other advantage here is that they do leverage publicly available information often, not all of them, but um, this can help to increase transparency. And I think one of the goals of at least some of these programs um, has been to sort of be free of political constraints um, and to be able to disseminate that information, disseminate that information um, widely and, and rapidly without concern of, of potential um, uh, fallback. Now, there are disadvantages to this. Um, right, when you put out a signal out there and you capture a whole lot of information from many different sources, all of the information that's presented, it may not be accurate, or I think more often it may not be significant or clinically significant. Um, and so trying to parse through that, I think, can be challenging. And the sources may also present bias information. And we know this from some of the work uh, that I have done with ProMed, that um, there are certainly blind spots um, that are present when you, when you think about these types of systems, particularly those that are um, really reliant on sort of signals from the internet because there are areas of the world where um, internet penetration is not necessarily um, as complete as it may be in some of its counterparts. Um, they also use broad case definitions or sometimes syndromes alone, which as we know, can sometimes not be completely accurate. And there's no standard data format, which I think really plays into, which is really, I think, an issue of concern when we think about research, because this information can take quite a lot of time to synthesize um, and can often rely on a, a level of or an element of uh, human data curation, um, which is take quite time consuming. And so just to talk a little bit about uh, more about some of these systems, I've already mentioned ProMed, one that I'm the most familiar with um, as I've worked with them for several years. And they really started in the 1990s um, as really an email-based program um, that was just trying to help disseminate information from um, experts and individuals that were working on the ground. There are many others. Um, I put, because I know my audience um, based mostly in Ontario, um, I put the Global Public Health Intelligence Network, or GFIN, which was its a Canadian counterpart. It also, it actually arose really in parallel with ProMed. And I know it's gone through its own transitions, which I won't go into here, as I know you probably know much better than I do. Um, and then, of course, so many others uh, as well. I wanted to talk about a couple. Health Map is another one also based in Boston as ProMed is, um, and they really do use these sort of algorithms to scan the internet 24 hours a day looking for particular surface signals that might be of interest um, or might indicate an impending outbreak. Um, the couple of other programs that I wanted to just mention here <clears throat> is um, EpiCore, which doesn't isn't really exactly a, a, a internet-based or informal disease event monitoring system, but rather is sort of an adjunct and a collaboration between ProMed and HealthMap and several other institutions um, in, in terms of trying to develop an enhanced participatory surveillance model. And so EpiCorps really is a program that has tried to recruit field workers on the ground, public health workers on the ground, clinicians on the ground, um, to be part of this core um, who the who some of these systems from Med and Health Map can reach out to um, if there is potentially an event or a couple of events of concern. They can send out an RFI a request for information to the folks that are part of EpiCore who can then um, who potentially are on the ground or more, may have links to colleagues that may know more. Um, and then those individuals can then feed that information back into a central system to be able to help buttress whatever um, concerning events um, or concerning questions might come up. One of the benefits of EpiCorps is that you can actually submit your information anonymously, 
And so that provides, I think, another level of um, support for individuals who may want to report something but may be concerned about the implications of doing so. Um, another one that I haven't put on here is EIOS, um, which is really part of the WHO and has really been working to um, combine a lot of these data streams together to be able to better inform early and rapid outbreak detection. And then the last one I wanted to briefly mention, um, which is one of the newer ones, um, is global.health. And it works a little bit differently. There was a nice paper in scientific reports, uh, I think at the end of last year, that actually talked about the process and um, of, of creating this uh, program. And they have a really nice website if you want to check it out. But um, as you can probably tell, a lot of these systems um, really report in aggregate. So aggregate case counts, aggregate um, uh, fatalities, et cetera, um, which is helpful in terms of you know, early rapid reporting. But um, when we think about things like disease or transmission dynamics, individual level data is really can be more helpful in that regard. And that's what global.health um, is, uh, is trying to do. They collect individual, real-time individual level anonymized data um, and have published it onto this website. They've used COVID as a case study and, and I think are gonna to continue to be building more in the future um, in terms of providing that type of information, but it is openly accessible to individuals if this is something of interest to you. Um, and so this is a, and this is a figure that I really like. Um, it was from a paper in uh, PLOS One in 2013. And I think it really nicely captures how many of these types of systems can work and the advantages, which hopefully by now I've hammered in, um, is that really the, the timely, accurate, and early reporting and detection of uh, impending outbreaks is really where the value of these, of these systems lie. Um, and you can see here in this figure that they looked at all events, um, human cases, and then epizootic so well, as well. And, th and that's something I think I didn't mention previously, but many of these systems um, really take a One Health approach or use a One Health framework to, um, to try to report on events. ProMed, for example, not only reports on human events, but also events affecting animals, um, as well as plants and toxins as well. Um, and what the point of this figure really is, is that um, they found when, when the authors looked at various outbreaks that, um, that these, these systems were often very early or earlier um, in a number of days um, in terms of reporting before official notifications went out. But actually that when you combine the programs together, that is really where you get the most um, bang for your buck uh, in terms of having really early reporting systems that are also accurate. And I wanted to bring up that sort of information because I think that has kind of played into two initiatives now, really on the heels or in the midst of COVID-19 that have popped up. Um, one, which is the US CDC that recently announced a center to advance the use of forecasting and outbreak analytics, um, which these real-time systems can be used for and have been used for and are, and are very applicable for. Um, and I know with the US CDC, center one of the things that they're going to be looking at or that they have discussed looking at is is incorporating some of these systems into those data streams um, and so the combination of those i think again referring back to the prior figure um, may provide some information sort of earlier on that remains accurate as well um, and similarly the who also recently announced a hub for pandemic and epidemic intelligence based in uh, berlin i believe um, and they too are looking into using a lot of these data streams in terms of informing um, their sort of epidemic intelligence and potentially forecasting as well. Okay, so moving on to the second learning objective, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the applications of these events and some of the ways that I've used it and, um, and others I think have begun to use it as well. Um, and as an aside, I, I wanted to make two points um, because I, I've given uh, this talk or similar talks to clinical audiences and I'm always asked the question, well, this is great, but um, are there any clinical applications for these programs? And so um, the couple that I um, have found very useful back when I was doing more travel medicine, um, which uh, unfortunately stopped over the last few years, but um, I find that these systems are helpful in that regard, um, in terms of thinking about the context of patients where they've been or where they've, or where they've transited through um, and um, helping that inform my differential. And then the second thing I wanted to just point out is that ProMed specifically, um, they are comprised of one international 
feed, but then they have several regional feeds. And most recently, um, they've developed a feed specifically for antimicrobial resistance. And so they report on um, events uh, related to that topic, which I think is of cer certainly public health, but also um, clinical significance as well. And so something else to, to be aware of, I think. Okay, so in terms of very basic uh, application. So this is um, some work that my myself and my colleagues did early on, just thinking about how we can use information from PomeMed and HealthMap um, to just discern basic epidemiological trends. And one of the benefits, I think, is because it really is a global system, you get some more information um, that's a little bit easier to digest, thinking about uh, trends globally, but also thinking about events that may have cross-border implications, which can sometimes be difficult to um, ascertain otherwise. And so we looked at um, listeria. This was in the wake of the large outbreaks that occurred in South Africa related to Poloni. Um, and we found that over time that the number of international listeria events, so events that um, that involve one or more, rather two or more countries, um, have actually been increasing over time. And, and the characteristics of those events have also changed over time. So uh, many of them have been outbreaks. There have been some that have been precautionary recalls as well. There have been many hospital acquired events. And as I mentioned, um, many of those events that were, that were reported involved mul multiple countries. And when we thought about this more, we, we, um, we thought that this was probably related to just the way in which um, food packaging and the way in which food preparation really now spans multiple countries. It's not necessarily just a local process anymore. <clears throat> um, the second application, which is something that I have been working on with for the last several years too, is um, a program called Mapping the Risk of International Infectious Disease Spread or MRIDS. This was meant to be a user-friendly tool for outbreak response and epidemic preparedness. Now, this was actually initiated um, back in 2015, I believe, in response to a call for um, uh, for these types of tools <clears throat> with the goal really of um, providing information with automated intelligence capabilities that incorporates a lot of different things that we know to be important in forecasting. So population density, for example, as well as risk for projections to describe um, the risk of importation or where infectious diseases are most likely to arrive from and depart to for specific countries. With the goal of this platform being that it's free of charge and incorporated into something with extensive end user testing. And so the case study actually came from the 2014 to 2016 West, Af uh, West Africa Ebola outbreak with the goal of then being able to apply it and rapidly scale it to other pathogens of significance. Um, and so this was a collaboration between several uh, institutions. And um, the goal, as I mentioned, was using multiple data streams, including not only these informal disease event monitoring tools, but also things like international flight data and health center data um, to then feed back into this model that could provide um, actionable items for, um, for policymakers or healthcare workers, et cetera. And I think one of the nice things about this project has been that at the beginning, there were really um, needs assessments that were conducted uh, with public health officials in West Africa that had been affected by Ebola in trying to understand what were the questions that they really wanted to be able to answer with a program like this. And so this is just some data that was recently published um, off of that sort of initial case study of um, cases in, in West Africa related to Ebola during that time period. And we found here that when you looked at case counts um, itself, that the, these sort of real-time data streams are quite accurate in being able to capture um, to being able to capture cases, though sometimes the forecasting capabilities were limited um, just by the way that the data was presented and the sparseness of the data. But really where a lot of the benefit lied um, or laid with with these types of programs was in being able to estimate the relative risk of importation of the epidemic. And so um, this is just demonstrating a couple of the regions that we looked at that, that were affected um, by Ebola and um, really using um, some of the forecasting data and, and these real-time data to be able to estimate that risk of importation. And it was fairly accurate there. 
So another application, something that I've become more interested in is thinking about um, designing, designing event monitoring or surveillance systems to be able to take into account um, signals even prior to signals that are traditionally considered. And so not just cases, but what comes prior to cases. And so one of the things that we know, um, or that there has been quite a bit of study on, is thinking about what are drivers of disease? What are drivers of emerging infectious disease events? And there are many. So things that I think are quite intuitive at this point, but um, increasing human wildlife interaction, land use and land degradation, human demographics, um, uh, conflict, climate and weather increasingly as well. And so this was a paper from 2015 that had actually um, sought to characterize some of these drivers and also think about where some of this data may come from um, that's openly accessible. And so there's, there's quite a lot of it here, both at a global level and also at a regional level, with the idea being that you could then potentially feed this into um, a digital surveillance platform. Um, and so here you see that <coughs> Figure A is really looking at traditional disease detection um, and sort of its association with then digital disease signals. And so you see that the um, that there is some signal early on with just these digital disease events. But then when you start to factor in some of these drivers, there is the potential um, for understanding how a certain confluence of these factors may actually predate the, the first signals of, of disease. Um, so I really, I like this figure. I, I like this idea a lot. Um, I think it's quite interesting, though, obviously, there are a lot of limitations to it. Um, but we did start to do a little bit of work in this area, thinking about these disease drivers, particularly in relation to conflict. And so um, my colleagues and I, in conjunction with colleagues at um, Imperial College who are interested in the conflict in Syria, looked at vector-borne disease um, pre-conflict and sort of during this conflict period, finding that um, Indeed, there have been more reports of vector-borne disease um, post-conflict. And I think the really interesting point here was that many diseases that were endemic only to Syria, to Jordan, um, have actually now been found outside, particularly in neighboring countries that host many of the refugees or the individuals that have been forcibly displaced by conflict. And so this is some unpublished data. Um, really, I just, I like the way that this looks. I rarely get to use bar charts, so I just need, felt I needed to put this in here. But um, um, I think this sort of demonstrates many of the cases of vector-borne disease that were reported following conflict were leishmaniasis and specifically cutaneous leishmaniasis, which is a highly disfiguring can be a highly disfiguring um, and stigmatized disease um, that has a long incubation period. And so likely individuals that were forcibly, forcibly displaced were infected and then um, once, uh, and then it wasn't recognized that they had been infected or had developed disease until, um, until thereafter. So those are a couple of the particular applications that um, I found for some of these events and sort of a, um, a research uh, from a research perspective. As I mentioned, epidemic forecasting and real-time epidemic forecasting particularly is one of the uh, large applications for this type of data. And so I wanted to take a second to talk about some of that, those limitations, because I think it's something that's become um, much more ubiquitous now in sort of the uh, COVID period. I won't say post-COVID period, but it, within the COVID period. Um, and so in terms of thinking about what kind of data is really helpful for real-time global epidemic forecasting, I think a lot of these, again, are fairly intuitive. So having accurate case counts, understanding mobility, host susceptibility, environment susceptibility, healthcare capacity, I think something that wasn't really thought about uh, previously. I think we're thinking more about real recognizing the importance of knowing how many physicians, how many beds, nurses, um, other medical professionals or healthcare professionals are available to be able to serve in the, in the in the situation of an outbreak, as well as population density. So there are a lot of open access data sources to be able to try to get at this information, um, but they're, they are limited by some of the same limitations that I had mentioned previously. This is also, I'm a, I apologize, this graphic looks terrible, but um, I bring this here because I wanted to highlight one of the places that um, I think a lot of people that think about epidemic forecasting or even think about in terms of informal disease monitoring, um, one of the earliest places to get information really has been 
through the news media. We saw this with the West, with, um, the West African Ebola epidemic that many of the earliest cases were identified um, or were reported on through the media. And I think COVID has really amplified that potential um, that, that potential sort of data source. And many of these media sources have actually not only been reporting on this data earlier on, um, but they've also taken it a step further and have uh, in some cases even done some uh, basic analyses such as calculating excess deaths, um, as well as doing data visualizations as well. And so these are just some of the ones that have been really active during COVID, um, which I'm sure you're aware of, The Atlantic, The New York Times, Financial Times, The, uh, the Economist, um, et cetera. And they've been able to really provide a lot of information um, early on that has been maintained throughout the pandemic. Now, some of these are no longer as active anymore, but um, I think are still really useful. And, and one of the things that my colleagues and I have sort of been talking about or thought about is um, trying to encourage these kind of partnerships with the media because while there we may because I think that they fulfill a sort of complementary role um, though they may have a different sort of agenda or different um, endpoint than perhaps a researcher or a public health um, professional might have in terms of what to using this data or how to use this data. Um, and so I think those kind of partnerships may be helpful moving forward and in, in being able to get data that's quickly collected, um, but then being able to synthesize that into a way that may have public health implications. Um, and some just a few additional thoughts to consider when um, thinking about the use of these types of um, disease surveillance tools or invent monitoring tools. Um, I think we don't talk enough about the ethical issues surrounding this. And there was a really nice systematic review just last year um, that actually thought about or discussed six domains um, to consider when, when applying these types of event monitoring tools um, to public health. And I think a couple of them that were um, interesting to me or that sort of struck a chord with me were thinking about trust, digital integrity, and privacy and confidentiality. Of course, now there are some regional um, uh, context specific situations, I think, where these become more relevant. Um, I know in the US, for example, things like privacy and confidentiality um, are, um, are always brought up in terms of concerns with these types of public surveillance um, programs. So just kind of balancing that with being able to get information out there uh, quickly, I think is gonna be a challenge, um, forthcoming challenge. Um, so I, I have this slide extra credit um, because I realized that the, the title of this is Novel Tools and I, and I really only talked about digital disease tools, but I, I wanted to mention some others that I'm sure many of you are very well versed in, um, including things like wastewater surveillance. Um, I named something Building Better Buildings, but this is really thinking about um, uh, disease transmission dynamics within buildings. I think that's also something that we thought a lot about, not only within hospitals, but also just in public buildings as well. Um, and there are, have been many advances within the last few years in thinking about, um, for example, air sensor technology and measuring air fluid dynamics and how that may um, affect disease transmission thereafter. And then of course, genomic surveillance um, as well. This is obviously something that is um, a huge topic. Um, and I think we've really seen the benefits of it uh, over the course of COVID and, um, and we'll continue to see you thereafter. I, I thought of, while I was thinking about this talk, I came across this MMWR um, just from a couple of weeks ago that talked about wastewater surveillance in particular that I wanted to just highlight here because I thought it was a really fascinating, um, excellent piece of work. And um, this was really <clears throat> a collaboration between several public health departments in the US. They looked at detections of mutations associated with B11529 or the Omicron variant in wastewater. And they were finding or detecting these mutations or Omicron associated mutations before we really started to see the surge in many of these areas in the US. And so certainly, there's a lot of potential applications for here. This has obviously been being used prior to COVID, but I think um, has gained more traction recently and probably will continue to um, thereafter. So something I wanted to highlight. Okay, so I realize I've ended a little bit early, but um, I did wanna put up the second question. After this 
discussion or after this talk, I wonder how many of you would consider consulting a digital disease event monitoring tool now. I won't feel bad um, if you say, no, I don't want anything to do with it, <laughs> but I thought it was of interest to me at least. Okay, great. So it looks like there's a good uh, variety here too, but um, but certainly many, many folks are, are considering its use. So that's great. Um, you know, as I said, these tools are, many of these tools are open access and freely available um, to folks who, who may find it of use. I just wanted to thank some of um, my mentors and um, the editors at ProMed, as well as um, Health Map and other places that really have spent their time um, so much so much time in, in trying to improve these systems. Um, and I wanted to just have uh, take a second to thank all of you for taking the time to listen to me today. I run through that pretty quickly. Um, and I know there was quite a lot of information. So if there are any questions after the fact, please feel free to email me at any time. I'm always happy to talk. I also wanted to take a moment to just thank all of you. Um, I know I saw a list of some of the individuals who were coming today, um, and I know uh, many of you are actively involved in public health, and um, I, I wanted to just tell you how much I appreciate all the work that you've done and continue to do. I know it's been a very busy, um, sometimes trying couple of years, so thank you for that. And then also a special shout out, I saw that there were some infection preventionists here too. Um, as I said, as was mentioned, part of the work I do is in hospital epidemiology, and I know that that has also been extremely busy. So thank you so much for all that you do for, um, for us and for keeping us safe. And I have Great. some references here at the end. <laughs> thank you so much, Angel. That was a fantastic presentation. So we will now move to the Q&A pod to address some of the audience questions. So please continue to enter your questions into the pod if you have not already had the opportunity to do so. So maybe I will kick it off with a question. So um, I know that a lot of us received that ProMed um, alert in December, 2019. And of course, none of us knew what it would end up meaning for all of us. And so I was wondering if you could comment from your perspective, if you have any advice on distinguishing which ProMed alerts or which alerts from these systems are actionable versus which ones you sort of let pass you by. Yes, it's a great question. Um, and I've thought a lot about it. And um, that's actually something that we're working on right now. Um, so stay tuned. <laughs> um, in terms of having a more sort of objective way to use that information, I think it's really hard. Um, because I think that there are and you know, that was one of the, um, I think, cons or, or potential disadvantages is that you get so much of this information and knowing what ends up being significant and what doesn't, I think can be difficult. I think if you look at some of those early posts, um, you know, and some of the context that were provided by some of the moderators, I think those that really were seasoned and um, had a lot of experience, particularly with SARS, um, I think that they did raise a flag of concern related to, the, to, related to that particular um, initial post pretty early on. Um, and because they felt like they you know this has a similar flavor to things that we've seen before that we know have had you know significant um, impacts on morbidity and mortality. So um, I to me I think like that combination of um, you know having these automated systems alongside um, individuals who have a lot of the experience and content expertise to be able to contextualize that um, and to maybe give us advice about what may be um, significant down the road is kind of our best bet right now. And then hopefully what, as we continue to do more work, we'll be able to parse out uh, more objectively what are things that, um, that may be of more concern versus others. I wish I had a better answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. Okay, we've got questions coming in. So the next question is, are these internet systems created by regulated organizations or by individuals? Oh, that's a great question. So. It depends. Um, so some of them have been, some of them really started out um, based with individuals or based within academic institutions or not um, just, you know, interested individuals who have then grown it out, have created these networks. Um, I think some of the more formal sort of internet based programs are, are often based in academic um, institutions. Health Map I know is based in Boston Children's or is affiliated with Boston Children's um, and so um, hospital. Um, and so 
um, have that particular affiliation, but then there are others that are sort of more formally um, affiliated with potential governmental bodies. I think, you know, one of the benefits with some of these programs that I found is actually not having that a sort of official um, affiliation in some ways allows them to operate the way that they're meant to operate, which is being able to provide this information without potentially having those political constraints or having um, regulatory constraints. And, and so I think, and that's why I brought up the slide of the ethical considerations there. Um, and I think that is something that people that are interested in the field do continue to grapple with um, in terms of you know, wanting to get this information out there so that we can act upon it, but then also recognizing that there are other um, concerns at play that we may need to take advantage of, particularly I think when you start to get to the level of thinking about individual level data, um, certainly that opens up a whole, um, a whole sort of round of other issues. Great, next question. Is there any support available such as funding for introducing new monitoring tools? Um, if you know, please let me know. <laughs> um, I think uh, that's always been the challenge trying to get um, these mechanisms funded. I will say that I think with COVID, um, uh, there's been a you know an increased recognition and interest in the importance of these types of tools, and so there now is funding, um, foundation funding, for example, um, that I think is supportive of these types of systems. Um, but it is a stride. It remains challenging, I think, as, a, as with as with most things. Um, so I think there are, you know, there are places like the Rockefeller Foundation. They now have their Pandemic Prevention Institute, um, and um, and elsewhere that may provide support. I know the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has supported some of these efforts as well through grant, you know, individual grant based um, proposals. But if you find something more reliable, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Next question is, have these tools also been applied to the psychosocial and other consequences of epidemics? Great need there as well. Oh, this is a great question. And I love it. Um, and I totally agree. And um, I think at up to this point, no, um, they're not to the extent that I think it would be really helpful. Um, I am actually working with a group right now that is hoping to do something like that um, to try to integrate um, the psychosocial components of, um, you know, outbreaks, for example, um, to these systems. So hopefully more to come on that. I totally agree though, it's, it's so important. And I, and I think now we've recognized that, you know, after the last two years. So hopefully there'll be more efforts to, um, to support that. So I will say um, this isn't really an event based system, but there are, there have been, um, there are tools out there. For example, um, one that comes to mind is, um, uh, I'm blanking on the name, but they were specifically looking at vaccine hesitancy. This was pre COVID um, and they, they've created a, um, it's online. It's, um, Oh, I'm so sorry, I can't think of the word. It's out of the, um, um, I wonder if I have it here somewhere, the Vaccine Confidence Project. Um, and they actually have indices, they have developed an index that looks at um, factors related to vaccine hesitancy. Um, and so they do try to get at some of that sort of the, at least the psychosocial issues related to vaccines specifically. Um, but so I think think approaches like that hopefully will continue to we'll see more of that. All right, next question from the group: Are these disease surveillance tools free? Um, a lot of them are. <laughs> so ProMed, you can sign up on a listserv. Um, you can get alerts from them. Health Map, you can is also freely accessible. Now, um, and many of the other ones I mentioned to you um, are also accessible. And that's kind of the point to be open access, um, to be able to you know, provide these information. Now, now, I think the challenge lies in if you really want to do large scale analyses, um, that may be more difficult in terms of getting the information in a clean format. Um, and so that may be something where you may have to, depending on the on the system, um, may have to talk to the, the individuals that run it to see if they have, you know, if they have a package that they are either willing to give to you or collaborate with you or, or potentially you might have to pay for. But right now, many of these systems are openly accessible. Okay, what are your thoughts on whether these disease monitoring systems can be adapted for other outcomes, i.e. 
vaccine effectiveness? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so um, I think as of now, I don't know. Well, so again, every system is a little different. Um, as of now, they haven't really been set up for that purpose. Um, I think it would be great, particularly with these efforts to have sort of more individual level data to be able to capture information about vaccine effectiveness. Now there have been, um, I know, you know, there we do, at least in the US, we do have some systems that are looking at vaccine adverse events, vaccine re COVID related adverse events that you can report into, which I don't know that that's necessarily freely accessible, but um, I think, I think that the challenge there would be uh, if you're using these, you know, many of these systems do rely on eyewitness reports or, you know, looking at the internet for various signals. So I would suspect that if you were looking at something specifically like vaccine effectiveness, it may be fairly biased. Um, and we wouldn't really know how to measure that, um, right? Because this is really not, a, we don't necessarily have titers, for example, um, or neutralizing antibodies or, or, or whatnot. So um, that's very interesting thought, though. <laughs> I'm not sure how, I'm not sure, but maybe somebody, I'm sure someone much smarter than myself will, will be able to come up with it. <laughs> okay, uh, next question is, how can these systems be inclusive of the diversity of languages spoken in the world so that signals are not biased to English, for example? Oh, another great question. I totally agree. So um, I know at least with FROMED, um, they have regional, um, they do have, uh, as I mentioned, regional feeds uh, that, and they have translators to work on um, to be able to um, get the information, you know, translated um, uh, to make sure that all of those sources are being included. Um, but I do agree that, um, a lot of times, particularly if you look at research um, that comes out of some of these types of systems, a lot of them often are biased towards English sources, English um, sources only in English. So um, I think we need to do, I think we can do better in terms of um, improving that, whether it be through the use of translators or, um, or even just having systems, that maybe they don't need to be translated, just having systems that are in the local language that um, then potentially have a, a component of moderation there, or potentially even algorithms that can be designed to better incorporate um, or be more inclusive of those, of that diversity. It's super important. I totally agree. Oh, everyone's giving me such great ideas. I love it. <laughs> Okay, next question. What ethical issues do you think require more in attention in infectious disease, big data and forecasting? Um, I think, so um, a couple of things. So when we, I think, you know, uh, certainly the concern about privacy and com confidentiality comes up. And I think when you talk about big data, there's different ways of thinking about it, right? So if you're looking at aggregate data, um, that may not be, that may not be as much of an issue um, because you don't necessarily know um, you're not necessarily getting individual level data right so you don't know i mean similar to when things are published right like if it comes from a large data source you may not necessarily know um having said that i i do sometimes think and i saw a great talk the um a few weeks ago where they talked about something similar where um when we think about big data and infectious disease now and the information that we can get now and consent that's given now, that may actually be different than um, what is considered appropriate 10 years from now with hindsight, if that makes sense. So um, particularly if you think about the context in which the data is originally extracted. So it may be in, in, in a country or a region, for example, where um, you know at the time, that particular infectious disease may not be either well characterized or well known or or stigmatized, et cetera. But then 10 years down the road, if the you know environment changes, the political environment or the social environment, then um, the people that in initially maybe put their data in or allowed their data to be accessible may not want that available because it, it may actually put them at risk, if that makes sense. So I think 
when we think about designing these systems, we do need to think about that as well. Like what are the consequences, not only now, but what they may be in the future, because the context may be completely different in the future than, than what it is now. Um, I mean, I think that is really more of a concern with sort of, again, these individual level data. Um, and I think also sometimes with, even, even when data is presented in aggregate, when you have some of these smaller outbreaks that are captured, um, in a particular region, for example, I think there's some there are some ethical considerations there because they it, it, even though you may think like well it's not very identifiable I mean if it's a small enough area it it may be and there may even be concern for that particular area being being stigmatized as a result um, I think even as we saw right with COVID in the early days of COVID as well so. Um, it's a it's a challenge. It's a balance of being able to get the information out there, making sure that it's sort of de-identified enough um, so that, you know, there's not a concern that individuals will be at risk. But um, but also recognizing that, you know, if once you get into small enough regions that there, there certainly is risk and there is stigma, particularly I mean, with communicable diseases, there's always stigma. That's historical trend in humanity. We know that. Right. So. Um, those are the kind of, I think, some of the top ones that I think about, though. Right. Okay, so this question is somewhat related to one of your previous answers, but any potential for using it in other settings, such as environmental health for lead poisoning, et cetera? Yeah, so um, a lot of these systems actually also do uh, look at things like toxins. They report on toxins and environmental, large-scale environmental issues. So. Um, I know, just speaking from experience with ProMed, I know that they've reported on toxic algae, for example, um, and those potential downstream effects. So I don't think that this particular um, area has been as, um, I don't think we've taken enough advantage of it, honestly, but there are definitely, definitely applications there I think we should look into. Great. Next is a comment. Event-based surveillance is part of the Integrated Disease Surveillance and Response IDSR framework implemented in several countries in Africa for vaccine preventable diseases. And then on to the next question. Any recommendations on how to approach the change management when switching to such tools to increase their adoption? The change changed management. Um... I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure if I understand the question is so. So when you're implementing a tool like this, what can you do to um, increase its uptake? Uh, I see. Well, that's a great question also. Um, so, I mean, I guess at a local level, uh, yeah, you know, I don't, to be honest, I don't know if I have a great answer. That, that's actually a challenge that I have faced as well, um, particularly when I've given similar talks to maybe participants that aren't as, as gracious as you all have been uh, in terms of, in terms of their acceptance. I think we've been slow to accept it because, you know, there are, certainly are limitations to these systems. And um, I think the way that I frame it when I try to convince, you know, others that this may be a, a, an area of, of interest or, or maybe something we can implement has been to say again, to, to try to um, emphasize the point that this is not a replacement at all, um, that this is really meant to be an adjunct um, or complement something, an additional tool in your toolkit uh, to be able to enhance, enhance um, event monitoring um, earlier and to be able to potentially even help focus your, your resources earlier or limited resources earlier. So I think it's that's sort of how I've framed it to try to increase uptake locally. Um, not always successfully though. <laughs> I hope that answered the question. I, I apologize. No, that's great. Okay, that looks like all of the questions that we have for today. So as we wrap up today's PHO round session, I would like to thank Angel for presenting. I would also like to thank everyone who joined us today. It's so great to see such a strong virtual participation during such a challenging time for healthcare professionals and public health. So you can expect to receive a brief and anonymous PHO round survey for today's session. Please do try to complete it to help us improve our programming. 
And lastly, to access past PHO rounds presentations and view confirmed upcoming sessions, please visit the PHO website, head to education and events and click on presentations. Thank you all and have a wonderful day. Thank you.